Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Math 221. So today we're going to finish up section 8.4 and we'll start into section 8.5. Okay, so let's resume section 8.4, which was modular arithmetic with applications to cryptography. Okay, so I think this is where we left off last time. Uh, so we talked a little bit about why um, inverses modulo n are important. Those are going to be important because they allow us to make decryption formulas for um, crypto systems. And so I think we finished up uh, right here with the definition of an inverse of a modulo n. So I'm just going to remind you of what that is before we go over how to calculate them. So for all integers a and n, if the GCD of those two numbers is 1, in other words, they share no factors or they are relatively prime, then there exists an integer s such that a s is congruent to 1 modulo n. In that integer s, that is called the inverse of a modulo n. And the reason why that is important is it allows us to undo multiplication by a in the same way that in the real numbers you would usually undo, for example, you would undo multiplication by 7 uh, by dividing by 7. But when you're uh, only working with integers, you can't do division. So we have this concept of inverses modulo n in order to undo multiplication. So now let's go over how to uh, calculate these. Okay, so there is a way to do this by hand, but um, the way of doing it by hand is fairly complicated. And I think because this class covers so many topics that we don't really have time to completely do justice to it. So I want to first of all just teach you how to do it by um, computer. And then uh, if you want to do the homework and the tests and stuff, um, do it by computer, that will be fine. Um, so the website you want to use is uh, wolframalpha.com. And then you just go and in the search box there, you just type in something like this, inverse of 47 mod 20. And um, it's going to give you the result for that down here. Um, so we can just check that this is this is really the case. So if we do 47 uh, times 3, of course we get, um, let's see, that will be 141, I think. Um, so then 141, if we do mod 20 to that, um, that will be, uh, so we subtract all the copies of 20 until we get a number that is between uh, 0 and 19. Or another way to think of it is uh, you do long division of 141 by 20, and then the remainder that you get uh, will be, in fact, 1. Um, so that is what shows us that 43, or sorry, that 47 and 3 are really inverses uh, mod 20. So because when you multiply them together, you get 1 mod 20. Okay, I should maybe use the notation correctly by putting these in parentheses here. Okay, so now how do you do it by hand? So I put a complete example of how to do it by hand on here. And as you can see, it is pretty complicated. <laughs> um, so, okay, but let me go over how you do it. Uh, so our value of A for this example is 47, and then the value of N is 20. So I just made a little table here with A and then N, and then you're gonna have Q and R from long division. And then, so first you do uh, figure out what your Q and your R would be if you did long division of 47 by 20. So if you divide 47 by 20, it goes in there twice. So that's what Q is. That's the integer quotient that 20 goes into 47 twice. And then you'd have a remainder of 7, of course, left over. So then what you want to do is you want to write um, your R, A, N, and Q together in an equation like this. And um, you know uh, from the quotient remainder theorem that you can write um, the number that you're dividing on the left, and then you can write uh, the divisor times the quotient, and then sorry, that's not a Q, uh, and then plus the remainder. Um, and then you can, of course, rearrange that as well, like this, by just isolating R on one side. So you go to that form of the equation. So the remainder equals A minus NQ. And then don't worry about this last um, column for the moment, because that is the part that you actually do last. So you go across and fill in this top row in this order, like this. And then what you're going to do is on the next row, you're going to redefine. So this is step two. You're going to redefine A to be the previous value of N. And then you're going to redefine N to be the previous value of R. So it's already a little confusing, but um, you move those two entries over there like that. And then you do the long division again. So you calculate um, the quotient of 20 divided by 7. So 7 only goes in twice. And then that leaves you with a remainder of 6. And then you write R equals a minus nq again over here. So you go. 
Okay, pardon me. I just had to go corral my cat. Um, he really doesn't want you guys to get a math education. Um, okay, so after you fill in those columns on the second row, then you move n down to be the new value of a again, and then the old r is the new value of n, like that. And then you go across this bottom row like that, uh, find your new quotient, your new remainder, and then make the new r equals a minus nq equation. And then after you've done all that, um, you're going to finally fill in this last row here. You're going to fill it in from the bottom to the top. And so um, you start with your regular um, r equals a minus nq equation in the bottom row there. And then what you're going to do is kind of complicated. Um, so in the next row up here, uh, you're going to start with the final equation that you had in the row below. And then what you're going to do is you see the 6 right here? Okay, you have an equation for 6 over here that expresses 6 in a different form, and so you're going to plug that in there for 6, okay? And that takes you down to here. And so you have to be kind of careful because you want to simplify a little bit, but you do not want to simplify away the values of a and n, which were 20 and 7, that were in that row. If you want to leave those intact, don't multiply anything by them that would make them disappear, okay? But other than that, you are going to simplify everything else except for 20 and 7. So you're going to collect uh, all the copies of those that are in your equation. And then you finally, when, when you've done that, you get down to here. So you have 1 equals 7 times 3 minus 20. Okay, and then you're going to go back up um, to the next, to the top row up here. And you're going to start with that equation um, that you got down here. So you're moving all the way up here. And then similarly here, you, you moved that one there. Um, so up here, you're going to start with this equation that you had on the next row, and then um, look at the fact that it has a 7 in it. Okay, and right here you have an equation that expresses 7 in a different way, and so you're going to substitute that into there. Okay, and then you're going to simplify, but you're going to do it in such a way that you do not destroy the values of um, 47 and 20, the values of a and n that were in this row. So you can multiply and, and combine other things together, but not 47 or 20. And so the goal with that is that you finally end up with an equation like this that expresses 1 as being equal to 47 plus some integer, or sorry, 47 times some integer plus 20 times some integer. And that's exactly the, the equation that you need in order to be able to see what the inverse of 47 is, modulo 20. This equation right here tells you that um, the inverse, whoops, the inverse of 47 mod 20 is um, 3. So it's this value that's right here. Um, so now you can see I've just kind of drawn arrows all over the place. So um, <laughs> this is why it's confusing because the, the sort of the workflow goes all over the place. And that thing that you're doing in the last column there, that's called back substitution. And that is fairly um, challenging. Uh, typically. So uh, for that reason, I don't really care if you learn to do this by hand or not. Um, if you go and do it on Wolfram Alpha, they are definitely using this algorithm. It's just been programmed in an, such a way that um, the computer is doing it. Okay, so that's how you do it by hand. Okay, so now that we've theoretically at least done one example by hand, um, I'm just going to do the rest uh, by computer. So for this example here, um, this is from the homework, uh, it's 32. So for part A, find an inverse for 41 modulo 660. Um, so the answer here is going to be this uh, right down here. The result from Wolfram Alpha is 161. And uh, the reason why they're saying an inverse is because there actually could be some other numbers. I believe anything that is congruent to 161 modulo 660 would also um, work for an inverse. Uh, but this would certainly be the least positive um, inverse. Okay, so now that we have that, uh, we can actually apply that to solving part B. So for part B, they want the least positive solution for the following congruence. In other words, the least positive integer x that will satisfy this congruence. Um, so if you think about it, there are 660 different things that you could try plugging in for x that might work. Um, and that would certainly be too time consuming. And also notice that you cannot just divide through by 41, because if you do that, you won't get an integer. And we're only interested in integer solutions to these modular congruences. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to apply uh, part A. So we're going to start with 41x is congruent to 125 mod 660. And then we're going to multiply both sides by the inverse of 41. So we're going to multiply by 161. Uh, 
Now what I can do on the left is I can replace this by one, okay? Because 161 times one times 41 will be congruent to one mod 660. That's the whole meaning of the inverse. That's the point of having it. Uh, so on the left here, I'm just gonna have X. And then on the right, if we just multiply, we get uh, 20, one, two, two, five, and then we can do the mod 660 operation to this as well. Um, so 20,125 would actually be a solution to this congruence, but uh, we were asked for the least positive solution. Um, so we need to reduce this a little more um, mod 660. So I'm just gonna do the mod 660 operation to 20,125 and I get 325. So this will be the least positive solution for X that will satisfy that original congruence. Okay, so here's your homework problem. Uh, so go ahead and uh, try this one. So um, I would suggest you can do A and B in the same step, um, just using Wolfram Alpha, and then go ahead and apply that um, to solve the congruence in part C. Okay. So now that we've learned um, a fair amount about modular arithmetic, uh, there's certainly a lot more you can do. Some people spend their whole lives studying modular arithmetic, um, but we learned enough to do the RSA crypto system. So uh, this crypto system is named for Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman. Um, I believe they are two Americans and an Israeli, and they're all um, mathematicians and computer scientists. So they published this crypto system in 1977, and this is a contemporaneous picture from that era of them. I believe, um, actually, interestingly, there was um, uh, a version of this that predated 1977, but it was invented by someone um, who I think was working for MI6, which is the British um, intelligence service, and it was uh, classified until much later. So um, you can just imagine that, for example, in America, the NSA probably has lots of better crypto systems than those that are available publicly, <laughs> but they're classified. I do actually know one of my friends from graduate school worked for the NSA and um, her work, her mathematical research is also classified. Okay, so anyway, uh, the reason we're going to study this RSA crypto system is it's one of the simplest to understand and the most widely used public, key, sorry, public key crypto systems. Um, I'm not sure how much it's actually used anymore. It may be still used in some places, um, but for a long time it was uh, one of the most widely used and it's quite easy to understand. So let's get into it. Okay, so first let's go over how you encrypt with this system. So it's traditional in um, cryptography to call the people who are trying to communicate Alice and Bob um, because it's like A and B, you know. Um, so let Alice, Alice be the person who wants to receive encrypted messages and Bob is gonna be the person who is sending her encrypted messages. So Alice will pick two prime numbers, P and Q, and then she computes the product of P and Q. Um, so in this example, oh, I did, I think this is a typo, I meant to have uh, these numbers here. And then of course, when you multiply those, you get uh, 55. So for our example, we're using five, uh, 11, and then the product of those will be 55. Okay, so then once she's done that, Alice picks a positive integer E, and E needs to be relatively prime to this quantity, P minus one times Q minus one. So for this example, P minus one times Q minus one, that's five minus one times 11 minus one, which is 40. So we just need to pick a positive integer that is relatively prime to 40. So it doesn't share any factors with 40. So for example, the smallest one that we could pick in this case would be three. Okay, um, so the two numbers, P, Q, and E, those are called the public key. So that 55 and that three, that is the public key. And Alice goes ahead and sends that to Bob for him to use for encryption. So notice here that Bob does not know what, what P and Q are unless he is actually able to factor 55 and figure out what the two prime numbers would have needed to be. Now, in obviously in this example, 55 is easy to factor, but in real life, people use extremely large prime numbers, like hundreds of digits long, which would make P times Q basically impossible to factor. Um, and that is the entire basis for the security of this crypto system. If anyone is able to factor that number that is part of the public key, then they can decrypt your message. But if they can't factor it, then they can't decrypt it. So in this situation, if we assume that no one is able to factor that number, then only Alice is able to encrypt the messages that Bob, or sorry, to decrypt the messages that Bob sends her. Okay, so um, continuing on with how you encrypt. Um, so Bob encrypts the message using this formula right here. 
So all he does is he takes his message letters uh, one at a time and he calls them M and then he just raises that M letter uh, number uh, to the value E and then he does uh, mod by PQ. So that's all he does. And then M, it's gonna stand for, for us, we're just gonna use a single letter uh, to make it easier. But in real life, of course, people use blocks of letters because that makes it harder to crack the message. Um, so that'll stand for a letter or a block of, block of letters. And then C is a number standing for an encrypted letter or block of letters. Um, so for this class, like I said, we'll just use single letters to keep this simple. And I do have to apologize at this point because last time I actually used the wrong encoding system. So you need to start with A being zero and not A being one. And that's actually pretty important because when you do mod, the mod operation, you're gonna get back numbers that start with zero for the smallest remainder that you could get all the way up to um, PQ minus one would be the largest uh, value that you could get from doing the mod PQ operation. Um, so last time I had them going from one to 26 and then I was doing mod 26. But the problem is, is, is that if you mod, if you do 26 mod 26, you actually get zero, not 26. Um, so that's why you have to start with, with zero over here. So this time I've done them correctly. Um, so let's see what we get when we encrypt the message um, hello with PQ equals 55 and then E equals three. So all you do is you break it up into little chunks and here we're using one letter chunks and then you assign um, M to be the number that corresponds to each letter um, in this scheme right here. And then you do the formula here. So you raise each of those M's to the value of E and then you mod by PQ. And I just did that with the Wolfram Alpha. And then you get your answer. And then uh, usually the last thing is to convert back into your ciphertext. Uh, but in this particular situation, we can't exactly do that because we're getting numbers that are from zero to 54. And so obviously after 25, um, they don't stand for letters anymore because we run out of letters. Uh, so you kind of can't really do uh, this part. Uh, and I made a little note about that over here. So um, not all the values we got are in the range zero to 25. So in this case, we just have to leave our C values as numbers instead of converting them to ciphertext. Obviously, you could probably come up with some other scheme for doing this that had um, 55 different symbols, like you could use some punctuation or something. Or uh, if you use, you know, ASCII or Unicode, uh, they go into the hundreds of symbols. Okay, so that was the encryption, and now let's talk about decryption. So to decrypt the message, Alice has to compute the decryption key, D. And so here's what D is. D is the inverse of E modulo P minus one, Q minus one. So for example, um, in this example we've been doing where P is five and Q is 11, then P minus one, Q minus one is 40. And so the inverse of three modulo 40 is 27. Okay, and you can check that by just multiplying three and 27 and then you get 81. And then if you do the mod 40 operation, you get one. So that means three and 27 are inverses. Uh, or you can just go to Wolfram Alpha and type um, inverse, of, uh, inverse of 40 modulo 27, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, inverse of three modulo 40, uh, and then it will tell you 27. So notice here though, that what makes this secure is that you do have to know what P and Q are in order to calculate D. You can't calculate P minus one, Q minus one, unless you actually know what P and Q actually are. Okay, so then to do the decryption, it's very, very simple. It's just, you take your um, values for C, that were the, that was the coded message that you were given, uh, and you raise them each to the D, and then you do mod by PQ, okay? So um, in the example over here, this is the encrypted message and it's not in ciphertext, it's still just numbers because of the problem we talked about on the last slide. And then you just plug each of those into the formula and then you get some number out. And then the numbers here uh, correspond to the alphabet letters according to the same encoding scheme that was on the last slide. So um, seven is H, four is E and so on and so forth. Uh, so you get your message back. Okay, so just to um, give you a little tip, because this is gonna be on the next uh, quiz, I'm gonna ask you to decrypt a message that was encrypted with RSA. Um, so most calculators and even Excel can't, can't handle dealing with numbers that are as large as this, as something to the 27. Um, so you're gonna need to calculate those using Wolfram Alpha. And to do it efficiently, you can do a whole bunch of them at once using this notation right here. So you just put the list of numbers that you have for C into the curly braces there, and then you put um, the caret 27 mod 55 on the outside, and then it'll do them all for you at once. So it's uh, pretty simple. 
Okay, so why does the RSA crypto system work? So we don't actually have time to actually go over the proof of why this will decrypt the messages, why this formula um, that I talked about decrypts the message. Uh, but it is all in the textbook and it's not too high level. You can understand it if you try. Uh, it involves Fermat's little theorem and uh, Fermat is a pretty interesting character. He was actually a, a lawyer in France, I believe in the 1800s or was it the 1700s? Uh, but he did math in his spare time and came up with all kinds of cool stuff. So anyway, you can read about that in the book. Okay, so let's do some examples where we encrypt and decrypt. Just a couple of more ones. Um, so I'm going to do 37, 38, and 40. So in these examples here, we are using, they're calling it N. I think this is honestly a typo that's supposed to say PQ. So P times Q is 23 times 31 or 713. And then uh, E is 43. So that's the public key. All right, so let us try doing number 37. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make a little table here. So I'm gonna have my um, message. So that'll be C-O-M-E. And then um, I'm gonna have my letters, or my numbers for those letters. Um, so that's called, the variable is called M. Um, so let's see, C is gonna be two. O is gonna be 14, I'm just using this little um, thing down here. M is going to be 12 and E is going to be 4. Okay, so then for the encryption, uh, I'm going to raise each of these to the E and then do mod, um, let me write that up here. So C is going to be M to the E and then mod by um, 713. Okay, so I'm just going to go to Wolfram Alpha and just plug those all in at once. And this should actually say um, 43, because that is E. Okay, so the numbers I'm getting are 380, uh, 28, 48, and 374. Okay, so this would be my answer. Um, this is what I, if I were Bob, this is what I would send to Alice. Okay, so let us do number 38 then. So 38 is going to help us decrypt. So again, I'm just going to use um, Wolfram Alpha. So this is going to be 307. And so that is going to be my value of D because uh, 660 is actually 22 times 30. And that's my P minus 1, Q minus 1. Okay, so that's what I need to do uh, number 40 here to decrypt. So uh, what I have for number 40 is my C values are 28, 18, uh, 675, and then 129. I think the reason the author put those zeros on the front is to like pad it, because normally if you were sending an encrypted message, um, you would have it padded so that all the parts or little chunks of the message were the same length. Um, but we can just treat those like regular numbers uh, for decryption purposes. Okay, so then M is going to be C to the D, which is going to be 307 mod 713. Okay, so I'm just going to do this at Wolfram Alpha again. And I'm getting 14, uh, 9, 3, and 5. Sorry, my pen keeps messing up. I think the battery connection is bad. Um, okay, so that is a five there. And then so we're going to uh, turn this back into the message text uh, using this little table over here. Okay, so 14 is um, O, and then nine is J, and then, hmm, this message is kind of nonsensical already. <laughs> Three is D, and five is F. Um, hmm, I wonder if I did this right. So I think what I'm noticing is that if I would have done um, the, no the letters that are one before these, um, I would have gotten the following N, I, C, and E, which would have made more sense as an answer. Um, so I guess what I'm concluding here is I think the textbook author is actually using that um, scheme that I talked about originally, which is the following. Um, They're using a equals one, b equals two, c equals three, dot, 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 um, down to z equals, oops, z equals um, 26. Uh, 
So yeah, I guess you're going to have to use that scheme to, to get the correct answers that are going to match up with the back of the book. I actually think that they should use the one that starts with zero, but um, well, I can't do anything about it. Um, so that's that would give us this, and then this scheme that I said would give us that one. Um, yeah, so sorry about that, guys. Um, but anyway, this is how you do these problems, and I will definitely make it clear on the quiz uh, which um, letter encoding scheme you should use. Okay, so here are your homework problems, and um, again, I have to apologize and say that you should use the one that starts here um, with one, two, three, four, etc. Um, rather than the one that I had put up there. Sorry about that. Um, so go ahead and try these, and then uh, pause the video and check your answers in the back of the book. Okay, so that finishes uh, with section 8.4, and let us go ahead to 8.5, which is partial order relations. So um, we've talked about a special kind of relation, which is the equivalence relation. Remember that the equivalence relation was one that had the properties of reflexivity, uh, symmetry, and transitivity. So there's another type of special relation, uh, which is called a partial order. And partial orders are used to model all kinds of different, very useful situations. Um, for example, uh, you can think of the situation of classes having prerequisites that can be modeled with a partial order. So for example, math 111 is a prerequisite for math 221. So we could have a relation where math 111 is related to math 221. And then there can be a lot of situations that are like this, like for example, in manufacturing, um, some tasks have to be completed before others. So for example, you have to build the foundation of a house before you can do the walls of the house. You have to do the walls before you can do the roof and you have to have the walls also before you can do the, uh, like the wiring, the electricity and things like that. Um, so you can model a lot of different useful situations with a partial order. So let's get into exactly what they are. Okay, so before I tell you exactly what a partial relation is, we have to talk about the concept of a relation being anti-symmetric. So here's our definition. Let R be a relation on the set A. R is anti-symmetric if and only if for all A and B in uh, capital A. If A is related to B and B is related to A, then A equals B. So the way to think about this is anti-symmetry is basically saying that you cannot have both a related to B and B related to A, unless A and B are actually the same elements. So in other words, you can think of it as for all A, B in set A, if A is not equal to B, then we cannot have both A related to B and B related to R. i uh, sorry, B related to A. That's what it means by anti-symmetric. There's no symmetrical pairs like that. So the only time you can have symmetrical pairs, uh, A related to B and B related to A, is when they're actually the same element, like this one, A related to A. You can still have that, that type of them. So a lot of relations that you already know about are actually anti-symmetric. Uh, like for example, the div divides relation, um, the less than relation, greater than relation, less than or equal, greater than or equal, and also the subset relation. Those are all anti-symmetric. Okay, so before we look at a couple of examples, I want to remind you about arrow diagrams for relations because this will be asked about in the example. So remember that we can make a diagram of a relation using a directed graph, which is also called an arrow diagram, uh, like the one that's on the right there. So if our relation is R, then this diagram, the way you read these arrows, is the base of the arrow is related by R to the head of the arrow. So for example, um, 2 is related to 18. That's coming from this arrow that is right here. Okay, so the first part is the two that's at the base and then the um, part on the right is uh, 18, which is at the head of the arrow. Okay, so your little arrow goes like this. All right, so then for example, we also have um, like one is related to two. Uh, we have one is related to itself by the by these two arrows here uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's do uh, a couple of examples and then you'll do a couple of homework problems. Uh, so each of the following is a relation on the set containing 0, 1, 2, and 3. Draw directed graphs for each relation and indicate which relations are anti-symmetric. Okay, so I'm going to start with C. Um, so the relation is being given by ordered pairs, but the elements in the relation are just these four, or the set that the relation is on is just these four um, elements, 0, 1, 2, 2, and 3. Uh, okay, so for C here, we're seeing that zero is related to zero. So that means zero points to itself. 
and then uh, 0 is related to 3, so there's an arrow from 0 to 3. And then 1 is related to 0, so there's an arrow from 1 to 0. And then 1 is related to 3, so there's an arrow from 1 to 3. And then 2 is related to 2, so there's a little loop here. And then 3 is related to 3, so there's a loop there. And then 3 is related to 2, so there's an arrow there. Okay, so is this anti-symmetric? So remember, in order to be anti-symmetric, um, what that would mean in this case is that you can't have an arrow pointing both ways between two different dots. Like you can have the arrow that's a loop between one dot to itself, which is basically kind of like pointing both ways, uh, but you can't have an arrow pointing both ways between two different dots. Uh, so this is anti-symmetric. Uh, so I'll just summarize what I just said here. This is anti-symmetric because there are no um, two dots, two dots, sorry, this pen has really had it, um, oh, dots, um, <laughs> with arrows pointing both ways between them. Okay. All right, so let's look at part D. So it's on the same set. So let me just draw that. So 0, 3, 1, and 2. Okay, so we have uh, 0 is related to 0, so that's the loop. And then 1 is related to 0, so that's an arrow from 1 to 0. 1 is related to 2, so that's like that. 1 is related to 3, that. 2 is related to 0, goes there. 2 is related to 1. Mm -mm, I already see the problem there. Okay, and then 3 is related to 2. And then 3 is related to 0. Okay, so this one is not anti-symmetric, and I mentioned it when it appeared. So this is not anti-symmetric because we do have that um, 1 is related. So this is the R4 relation. 1 is related to 2 and 2 is related to 1, but 1 and 2 are not equal. So remember that uh, the definition of anti-symmetric is if A is related to B and B is related to A, then A and B are supposed to be equal, but here we have that they are not equal. Okay, so this is not anti-symmetric. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and try uh, part A and part B, and then you can check your answers in the back of the book. Okay, so now let's talk about the actual definition of a partial order relation and also the notation that we often use for it. Uh, so let R be a relation defined on a set A. A, sorry, R is a partial order relation if and only if R is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. So um, remember that for an equivalence relation, it was reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, but for a partial order relation, it's reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. So that's where they differ at. Um, so what these properties are meant to kind of mimic or um, imitate is the properties of the less than or equal relation. So for le less than or equal relation, uh, you do have that, so if we're doing it on the real numbers, for example, you do have that every real number is less than or equal to itself, so that's reflexive. And you have that for every pair of real numbers x and y, if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x, then x is equal to y, so that's uh, anti-symmetric. And then for the transitive, for all triples of real numbers x, y, and z, if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to z, then x is less than or equal to z. So that is transitive. Okay, so the partial order relations mimic the less than or equal to relation. And so because of the fact that the less than or equal than relation is kind of like the, the prototypical uh, partial order, uh, we actually use this symbol right here oftentimes to stand for a generic or just a general partial order. So that'll be used to stand for lots of different um, things that are partial orders throughout mathematics and computer science. And we do actually just read that aloud the exact same way. Um, we read that x is less than or equal to y, um, or if it's done the other way around like this, um, then you would read that as uh, y is greater than or equal to x, just like this. Um, 
So, but just be careful that if they're using that symbol, it they may be using that terminology, but it might mean something pretty different from the actual less than or equal to relation. And then a final thing to note here is that a partially ordered set is also called a poset. So it's like P-O for partially ordered and then set. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So we're going to try to figure out if this is a partial order or not. So define a relation R on the set Z of all integers as follows. For all M, N, N, Z, M is related to N by R if and only if every prime factor of M is a prime factor of N. Okay, so I think I can pretty, pretty easily think of a counterexample to this. Um, so I believe that this would be reflexive, and I think it is also um, transitive, but I don't think it's anti-symmetric. So that's usually where these are going to um, fail at. So I don't think this is anti-symmetric because, let me give you an example. So 2 squared and 3 squared, um, let that be m, and then let 2 times 3 uh, be n. So then uh, every prime factor of m is a prime factor of n. Okay, so the prime factors there are just 2 and 3. And, okay, so that would mean that um, m is related to n. And every prime factor of n is a prime factor of um, m. So n is related to m. Um, but m is not equal to n. Okay, so this relation is not anti-symmetric. So if you can think of a pair of numbers or elements that are related in both orders, but they are not equal, um, then it will not be anti-symmetric. Okay, let's look at another one. So define a relation R on the set of all real numbers R as follows. For all x, y in the real numbers, x is related to y if and only if x squared is less than y squared. Okay, so again, I think I can think pretty easily of an example of x and y where it would be true in both orders, um, but they're not the same number. Okay, so let me just show you. So let x equal 1 and y equal negative 1. Okay. Then uh, 1 squared is less than or equal to negative 1 squared, because they're equal. So we have uh, that x is related to y. And we also have that negative 1 squared is less than or equal to 1 squared. So that means y is related to x, um, but x and y are not equal. So r is not anti-symmetric. Okay. All right, so let's look at one where it actually is um, a uh, partial order relation, and we'll look at proving it. So let P be the set of all people who have ever lived, and define a relation R on P as follows. For all R comma S in P, R is related to S if and only if R is an ancestor of S or R equals S. So is R a partial order relation? Prove or give a counterexample. So I'm going to say yes, and I'll do a proof. So I'll show you why this is true. So just like when we were doing proofs for um, equivalence relations, you have to do the three properties in like three parts. So first I'll do reflexive. Uh, so I'm going to let uh, R be in P. So R is a person who has lived. Um, then, so we have to show that R is related to itself. And one of the conditions we have is equality. So we have that R equals R. So that means that R is related by capital R to little r, like that. Okay, so capital R is reflexive. And now let's do anti-symmetric. So anti-symmetric will probably be the most challenging one to prove, especially if you have an or condition for your relation, because you have to check some uh, cases. Okay, so we're going to let R comma S be in P. So these are people who have lived. And we're going to assume that R is related to S and that S is related to R. And now we want to show, so the goal that will allow you to show this is 
uh, anti-symmetric is to show that R equals S. Okay, so that would um, prove that it was anti-symmetric. So how are we going to do this? We're going to use our assumptions, exchange those for some information. Okay, so since uh, R is related to S, what does that mean? That means that either R is an ancestor, just to abbreviate it like that, of S, or R equals S. Okay, and then we also have this information from our assumption. Um, since R is, S, sorry, is related to R, that means uh, the following. It means that um, S is an ancestor of R, ancestor of R, or uh, S equals R. Okay, so now we need to kind of stop and think about like what is actually the case here. I mean, it's not possible for them to both be ancestors of each other, right? That's completely impossible. Your ancestors have to exist before you did, um, so they can't have both existed before each other. Um, it would be possible for them to both be equal to each other. In fact, that's what we want to show. Uh, would it be possible for one to be an ancestor of the other and them to be equal to each other? Um, no, that's not possible. Um, so basically there's like, there's four cases and you can show that three of them are impossible. So let me just break down the four cases that are coming from the two or statements. So the four cases are the following. Um, R is the ancestor of S and um, S is the ancestor of R. Um, this is impossible, so that never happens. Uh, okay, next case, R is the ancestor of S and, so that would be coming from the first OR statement. And then from the second OR statement, the other possibility we could have gotten is that S equals R. Okay, this is also impossible because um, you can't be your own ancestor. <laughs> uh, okay, and then so we broke down um, both cases of what happens when R is an ancestor of S. Um, so let's look at the other possibility from the first OR statement. Okay, so R equals S. And then from the second OR statement, we could have that, uh, oops, sorry, that S is the ancestor of R. Um, that's also impossible for the same reasons. Okay, and then our final last possibility is that R equals S. So that's the second part of the first OR statement, and then S equals R, which is the second part of the second OR statement. So since these are impossible, um, that means that they don't happen. These don't happen. Those cannot be the case. Um, so this last one, that's the only one that's left, this must be the case. And that is actually exactly uh, what we wanted to show. So we are done with showing that this is anti-symmetric. Okay, I hope that made sense to you. Um, all right, so for lastly for transitive, uh, this one could potentially be a little bit tricky as well. Um, so I think I'm actually going to go um, onto the next slide and do this one because I think I'm going to need a little more room. Okay, so this is the proof continued and we're going to do the transitive part. Okay, so transitive. So first you let um, there be three elements in the um, underlying set. So I'm going to let them be called, uh, let's say, R, S, and T. So I'm not very creative. So let R, S, and T be in the set of all people. Okay, and then what we want to do is assume that uh, R is related to S and S is related to T. And then what we need to show to show that this is transitive is we will show um, that R is related to T. Okay, so we're going to do almost exactly what we just did on the last part. Um, we're going to have to break it down with some OR statements and some cases. So since R is related to S, that means that R is the ancestor of S, I'm just abbreviating it, or R equals S. Okay, and then likewise from our second part um, that we assumed, since S is related to T, that means that S is the ancestor of T, or S equals T. 
Okay, so again, just like before, we do have uh, four different possibilities that are coming from the fact that we could have either one of the two possibilities in both of those or statements. Uh, but this time there aren't going to be any contradictions. There's just going to be, um, they're all going to hopefully show us that, um, well, actually, I don't know, maybe there will be contradictions, but hopefully we're going to end up getting um, that R is related to T. Okay, so let's go through the four cases. All right, so case one, um, I'll just number them this time. Uh, so we're looking at the first part of the first or statement. So that's that R is the ancestor of S and the first part of the second or statement, um, S is the ancestor of T. Okay, so these two things together, if those are both the case, R is the ancestor of S, S is the ancestor of T, then R is the ancestor of T. Uh, which would imply that R is related to T, like that. Okay, so case two, um, I'm going to again use the first part of the first OR statement. So R is the ancestor of S, and then I'm going to use the second part of the second OR statement, and S equals T. Okay, hopefully you can see here if R is the ancestor of S, and S is, a, the, S is just the same person as T, then that means that R is also the ancestor of T. So that would also imply that R is related to T. Okay, case three. So now I'm going to use the second part of the first OR statement. So that is where R equals S. And I'm going to use the first part of the second OR statement. So that is where S is the ancestor of T. Okay, so this is similar to before. If R is the same as S and S is the ancestor of T, then R is the ancestor of T. So that's not enough. Um, T as well. So that means that little r is related to T. And then finally the last case is using the last part of or, both or statements. So r is equal to s and s is equal to T. That implies that r equals T, which also implies um, that little r is related to T. So in all cases we get what we wanted, which was that um, r is related to T. Okay, so that has showed um, that the relation is transitive, and that's it. That's the end of the proof. Okay, so here are your homework problems. You have two of them, um, and I believe one of these is a partial order and one of them is not, but uh, you'll have to double check that in the back of the book. Okay, so now let's talk about Hasse diagrams. Um, I personally find these kind of fun, just like all diagrams are kind of fun. Um, so a Hasse diagram, it is similar to an arrow diagram, but it's more simplified and streamlined and basically just to make them easier to draw because as you can see in these examples here, your arrow diagrams do tend to get really messy after um, you have a number of elements on there. Uh, so to make a Hasse diagram, what you do, you start with a directed graph or an arrow diagram. This two words are synonymous. Uh, and then you do the following. So you delete all of the loops at the vertices. Um, you rearrange the vertices so that all arrows are pointing upwards. They don't have to go straight up, they can go diagonally up, but they do need to go up at least a little bit. And then you delete all arrows whose existence is implied by the transitive property. So like for example, what that means is here we have this arrow. Oops, oops, I can't get it. Okay, here we have this arrow, and then we have this arrow. So by the transitive property, that would mean that we also have to have this arrow right here that one, um, because uh, that's just what the transitive property means. If, if A is related to B, B is related to C, then um, A is related to C. Uh, so you can actually delete those. And then finally, you delete the arrowheads, leaving just lines. So basically, your graph becomes much simpler, like you can see on the one on the right there. Um, so when you're interpreting one of these Hasse diagrams, you have to keep in mind all of the things that have been done to make it uh, in your interpretation of it. So for example, when you're interpreting a Hasse diagram, you can assume that every element A is related to itself. And here I've given you the notation with the little um, curvy less than equals sign. And so you can also assume that if it is possible to move upward along a line from A to B, then that means that A is less than or equal to B. So for example, here we have um, this element here is less than or equal to this one, although we're actually using the subset relation. So this is telling us that the set containing A is a subset of the set containing A and B. And then finally, the most important one is if you can move along a series of lines going upwards the entire way from A to B, 
then A is less than or equal to B. And that's because of the um, transitive property. It's a typo there. But that's because of the transitive property. So like, for example, um, this set here, B, that is a subset of this one up here, A, B, C. And you can move upward along this little uh, series of lines here, those two lines. Um, so that would imply that by the transitive property, there's also uh, a partial order relation, the subset relation going between this element right here, set containing B, and the set containing A, B, C. Sorry, there's a lot of traffic sounds in the background, I'm sure. I had to open my window because it's so hot in here. <laughs> okay, so let us look at an example, and then I'll ask you to try this as well. So let's consider the division or divides relation on each of the following sets A. Uh, so draw the Hasse diagram for each relation. Okay, so I'm going to do part B here. Um, so I am going to put, let's see, I guess I'll put two down here. And then let's see, where am I going to put three? So I think I actually need to put the prime numbers along the bottom. So I'm going to put two here and I'm going to put three here. All right, now let's look at four. I'm going to put four above two. And then I'm going to put a line between them because two divides four. Okay, does that make sense? Two divides four so that two should go below four in this um, Hasse diagram. All right, now what about six, for example? I think I'm going to put six here. And that's going to be above 3, and it's also going to be above 2, because 2 divides 6 and 3 divides 6. Now 8, I'm going to put 8 above the 4. And I do not need to draw a line connecting 8 to 2, even though 2 also divides 8, because I can just follow the line straight up from 2 to 4 and then all the way to 8. So the fact that 2 is related to 8 um, is implied by the transitivity of the diagram. Uh, let's see, I'm going to put 9, I guess I'll put it over here. So that's only going to be above the 3. And then 12 needs to be above, um, hmm, where should I put 12? I think I can put 12 here. So I'm going to put that above 6, which will also mean it's above 3 and above 2. And then I'm also going to draw a line from 4. Okay, so now you see that 12, if we follow the lines upwards, I can go from 2 all the way up to 12, and I can go from 3 all the way up to 12. And I can also go up from 4 to 12 and 6 to 12. Okay, and then finally 18, I guess I'm going to put that one here. So that's going to be above the 9, and it's also going to be above the 6. And then by transitivity, it is also above 2 and 3. Okay, so I think I put everything in here that I need to. So go ahead and pause the video, and you can try part A. Okay, so let's look at another example of drawing Hasse diagrams. So on these, we're using the power set for each uh, set in the two parts. So first I should write out what the power set is, I guess. So I'm doing part B here. So uh, the power set of S, this is all of the subsets of S. So first of all, there's the empty subset, and then there are the one element subsets. Oops, I forgot zero. Hmm. Okay, and then there's all of the two element subsets. So there's zero one, there's zero two, there is one two, and then there's one, oops, zero, one, two, like that. So that's the whole set. Okay, so um, I should tell you guys that I actually studied, uh, when I was in graduate school, I um, took an entire class where I pretty much studied nothing but um, post sets. And so I know like perfectly how to draw this Hasse diagram in the most um, optimal possible way, <laughs> um, just from memory. But uh, okay, let's go ahead and do it. So you're gonna have the uh, empty set down at the bottom. And then on the next row, I'm going to put my one element subsets. So I'm going to have zero, and then one, and then uh, two. And so each of those do contain the empty set as a subset, just like every set contains that as a subset. Okay, and then on the next row, I'm going to put the um, two at a time uh, subsets. So I'm going to put zero, one over here, and I'm going to put, um, I'm going to put zero, two here. And then I'm going to put one, two here. Okay, and so the set containing zero and one contains the set containing zero and the set containing one as subsets. And then the set containing zero and two contains these ones as subsets. And then finally, the set containing one and two contains those as subsets. And then finally, on the top, we had just have the one containing everything. Like that. And it makes a nice little cube picture, which is kind of fun. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and uh, try part A. 
Okay, so let's do another example. Um, so this one is kind of interesting because we're doing a partial order on um, ordered pairs. So you already know you can express a relation itself as ordered pairs, but then you can even have a relation on ordered pairs, which is a little bit confusing, I think. Um, but anyway, let S equal the set containing 0 and 1, and consider the partial order relation R defined on S cross S as follows. So for all ordered pairs A, B, and C, D in S cross S, A, B is related to C, D if and only if A is less than or equal to C and B is less than or equal to D, where less than or equal denotes the usual less than or equal to relation for real numbers. Draw the Hasse diagram for R. Okay, so this is one I don't know how to do off the top of my head. Um, I think what I want to do is first write out what S cross S is. Um, so this should have four things in it. I'll just try to do them in alphabetical order. Okay. All right, so let's see. Let me think about where these should live at. Um, I think zero, zero is going to need to be at the bottom because that's the least. And then um, I'm probably going to put zero, one, and one, zero right here and right here. Um, so zero, one is, or sorry, zero, zero is going to be related to zero, one because um, zero, zero. So let me just write it up here so it makes more sense. Um, zero, zero is going to be related to zero, one because uh, zero is less than or equal to zero and um, zero is less than or equal to one. Does that make sense? Uh, and then we're going to have this relation here uh, for the same reason. So zero, zero is related to one, zero for the same reason. And then I think at the top we're going to have 1, 1, and that's going to be related to everything, uh, or rather everything is related to 1, 1, uh, like that. So I think this is the diagram. Okay, so here is a homework problem for you to do. Uh, so yours is kind of similar to the one that I just did, but your diagram is going to look a little bit differently. Uh, it'll be the same for elements, but they'll be related a little bit differently. So go ahead and, and give this a try, and check your answer in the back of the book. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there for today because it's just about an hour now. Um, so send me an email if you have any troubles with anything. I know uh, many of you are finished with the test and that is great. Uh, send me an email if you're having any problems. I can kind of answer general questions if they're not too specific. Uh, don't forget to keep up with your quizzes. Keep retrying those quizzes. Um, if you retry it more than once and you're still doing badly, please send me an email and I'll, I'll give you some tips and some pointers. Um, and I'll see you next time.